On March 24, 2016, OSHA published a final workplace exposure standard for crystalline silica that cut the permissible exposure limit in half. Some in the stone industry view the new federal silica standard as unattainable, as well as costly and disruptive. Others provide arguments that OSHA should have focused on crafting new and innovative ways to get more firms to comply with current silica rules, which have played a huge role in reducing the number of silicosis cases over the past 40 years. While we will address those concerns later in this presentation, the primary focus of this webinar is to provide you with an overview of what you need to know about the new standard, specifically to help you gain a better understanding of the new standard, identify key compliance dates for implementation, and update you on what is being done by several trade associations with members impacted by this new rule. Before we get started, a couple of quick reminders. First, let's remember that this is an issue of employee safety and does not impact consumers. Press coverage of the new rule may lead inquiries from consumers or design professionals to you. Please, please assure them that silica exposure is not a consumer issue. By now, most employers have educated their employees on silica exposure and which types of stone have silica. For stone companies who also process engineered quartz surfaces or other products that contain silica, all of these same rules from OSHA apply. If you haven't already done so, please go online to naturalstoneinstitute.org forward slash silica to download some of the training resources referenced on this slide. If there is one key theme important to the safety of your employees that we want to impress upon you with this presentation, it is that you must measure silica exposure so you have the necessary data to plan your company's silica compliance plan. best treatment is prevention, so that's avoiding the exposure. Once the aggressive form of silicosis happens, the scarring in the lung progresses, we do not have any effective medication to halt that. And that's an important key message that came from that doctor. So now on to the standard. OSHA issued two standards where there used to be one. There's now one for construction and one for general industry. The Construction Industry Safety Coalition, or CISC, of which the MIA plus BSI and the Natural Stone Council are members, advocated for this separation during earlier OSHA hearings. This is important because if you were to group all industry into one set of rules, you know that wouldn't have afforded employers the opportunity to tailor exposure solutions to their specific workplace situations. So which standard? do stone industries need to utilize? It really depends on the activity or task and the location where the activity is being performed. From a very practical standpoint, we encourage you to look at it like this. If you are cutting stone in a controlled environment such as a fabrication facility, cut stone facility, or production facility, follow the general industry standard guidelines. However, when that activity shifts to the field, so you're in the field for installation or restoration, then the construction standard guidelines apply. For our members that are working in quarry environments, employers will need to continue to follow MSHA guidelines in the field or the quarry, and also follow OSHA guidelines when you move your activities into the production facility. Now, specific to OSHA, it is the general industry guidelines that would apply. Some have asked, what is MSHA going to do? Well, they've indicated that they intend to adjust their allowable PEL limit to match the new OSHA guidelines, but a formal date for implementation has not yet been announced. So let's go ahead and let's highlight a little bit about each of the two standards, starting first with the general industry standard, which again, applies to fabrication, cut stone, and production facilities. So employers, you need to comply 
and have all your ducks in a row by June 23rd, 2018. As we look at the standard, the first requirement is that you have to measure the amount of silica that your workers are exposed to in an eight-hour day. Now remember, this is a weighted average. And hopefully, you already have employee measurements that you can review and identify your current measurements. If those measurements are at or above the action level, and again, that's action level of 25 micrograms of silica per cubic meter of air, then you will need to implement a number of additional safeguards. Now, often we hear, well, we're cutting wet, so we're OK. It's great that you're cutting wet, and we advocate the entire industry to do that, but you still need to measure the amount of silica your workers are exposed to each day. And yes, for those that are familiar with the old standard, the allowable permissible level has been reduced. And again, it's been reduced to the 50 micrograms of silica per cubic meter of air. So if your, what your exposure is is over that amount, and again, that's over an eight-hour day, additional protective measures must be taken. So let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about some of those additional measures that you're going to need to take. First, you're going to look at limiting worker access to areas where they could be exposed above the PEL, using dust control to protect workers from silica exposure, providing respirators to workers when dust controls cannot limit exposures to the PEL. And it's important because some may want to just jump into providing all their employees with respirators. Remember that that's not immediately recommended. You must first exhaust other more efficient means to limit exposure. Uh, restricting housekeeping practices that expose workers to silica where feasible, and establishing and implementing a written exposure control plan that identifies tasks that involve exposure and methods used to protect employees. So you might be asking, where do I get all this information? Don't forget that these general guidelines are posted online for easy access. Just go to our website, Natural Stone Institute forward slash silica, and download all of the information. You may also need to offer medical exams, which include chest x-rays and lung function tests. Every three years, for workers who are exposed at or above the action level for 30 or more days per year, and, and when you read the standard, it's at or above the action level. Now, there are two dates for implementation for the medical surveillance that exist. And as you study this a little bit more, you will find that one of those dates is in 2018, one is in 2020, again, depending on how the measurements um, that were taken of your employees, what those results are. You know, finally, um, training and good record keeping is a must. And don't forget that the Institute has a variety of training resources available. You, need, you do need to train your workers on operations that result in silica exposure and find ways to limit exposure. And of course, make sure that you keep records of your workers' silica exposure measurements and also medical exams. So as we look to recap the general industry standard, uh, let's talk one more time about those compliance dates. For the general compliance, you have until June 23rd of 2018. For medical surveillance, the chest x-rays, the lung function uh, results, you have until 2018 or 2020, depending on how your employees' measurements turned out. And again, don't forget that the general industry standard applies to those working in cutting stone in a controlled environment, which for the stone industry is our fabrication facilities, cut stone facilities, and production facilities. So as we shift to talk a little bit about the construction standard, which impacts our employees working in the field, employers, you must comply with all requirements by June 23rd of 2017. Now note, this is one year earlier than the general industry standard. But you'll also find, as you study this standard, that employers who follow specific guidelines, and those specific guidelines, you're going to see a lot of references to a table one. Again, that's a table one, may not be required to measure worker exposure, which would certainly uh, be a benefit to smaller employers in terms of cost. 
Now, regardless of which exposure control method you use, you do need to do a number of things. Number one, uh, restricting housekeeping practices that expose workers to silica where feasible alternatives are available. Establishing and implementing a written exposure control plan that identifies tasks that involve exposure and methods used to protect workers, including procedures to restrict access to work areas where high exposure may occur. You do need to offer medical exams, including chest x-rays and lung function test every three years. Now this is for workers who are required by the standard to wear a respirator for 30 or more days per year. Designate a person to implement the written exposure control plan. Also the same training and good record keeping uh, practices are required. And a final note, uh, remember that the medical exam requirements for this standard are slightly different than the general industry requirements. And another big difference with this standard is that you must designate a person who will be charged to implement the written exposure plan with this standard. You know, as we indicated earlier, there are, there are options for employers to use a control method detailed in Table 1. Uh, table 1 of the standard details common construction tasks with dust control methods and procedures. Now, employers who follow Table 1 correctly will not be required to measure workers' exposure to silica and are not subject to the PEL. If you're looking for a copy of Table 1, we have posted it in our online silica page for easy reference. Now, there may be uh, those that choose not to use Table 1 or are unable to use Table 1. If that is the case for your company, then the following four items do apply. You will need to measure your employees to see if they're above an action level. And like the general industry standard, if you are at the 50 micrograms of silica per cubic meter of air, then you're going to need to offer additional protective measures for your employees, like using dust controls to protect workers from silica above the level, providing respirators to workers where, where required. And you will recognize as you study this standard uh, these four items, were, we also talked about them at length with the general industry. So like the general industry standard, let's talk a little bit more about the compliance dates for the construction standard. Those compliance dates are, it needs to be enforced and you need to be in compliance by June 23rd of 2017 and 2018 respectively. So as we talked earlier, um, what's the industry, the general construction industry doing? And as we talked earlier, there really are three things that we and many trade associations with members impacted by the standard are doing. One is litigation, one is getting more help from Capitol Hill, and then finally, uh, obviously continuing to produce and distribute training resources to help our companies impacted by this. So first, uh, a little bit about litigation. On March 31, 2016, the MIA plus BSI and the NSC joined a growing number of trade associations who came together to financially support litigation which was filed in Federal Circuit Court to challenge several aspects of the OSHA rule. Now the strategy behind the litigation is to get OSHA to either negotiate the implementation of the rule look at the cost of the engineering controls, medical exams, and so forth. But litigation is just one mechanism being used since the rule came out. Another mechanism is to legislatively influence OSHA appro appropriations from Congress. Now on the House side, the U.S. House of Representatives, over 70 representatives have already signed on to a congressman's letter and there is a similar effort occurring on the Senate side. So Stone Industry, uh, we recommend that you look at the links provided online and see if your representative has supported these legislative efforts. If not, please contact them and let them know that you have grave concerns about the new OSHA rule and how it will impact your business and the Stone Industry. Now one area of concern that we've really had along the way is the difference between what OSHA says implementation of the rule will cost because our analysis is dramatically different. 
And we do encourage you to download this How OSHA Silica Proposal Impacts Construction Report, which is on our website. And please share this report with your legislator because it shows, as I indicated, a vast difference between what, what they say it's going to cost and what we say it's going to cost. You know, finally, when it comes to training resources, this is just an excellent time for you to sit down with your team and review your overall safety training program and see what enhancements you may need to implement to improve your employees' knowledge, knowledge of silica exposure risk, as well as just general safety training in general. And don't forget that there are a number of training resources available to you, whether it's toolbox talks, training guidelines, or videos. We encourage you to utilize everything that the Institute Safety Committee has developed. Also now, with the support of the NBGQA Safety Committee joining us, there are additional resources coming. And one of those additional resources are in the upcoming weeks, we will be debuting a new online training university, which first and foremost will, will have over 100 safety training classes which will greatly help you help stone companies and you track and monitor employee safety training. More information is coming. You know, with over 1,700 pages in this OSHA ruling, there are bound to be clarifications as stone professionals and safety managers dig into the new standard. We will continue to monitor and offer tips and perspectives whenever possible. And a final note. Whether, whether the OSHA rule goes fully into effect, as referenced, or if it is held up by litigation in the courts or through appropriation tactics, it is vitally important that you take the time to measure your employees' exposure to silica. OSHA's Voluntary Inspection Program is a great way to do this. And if you're not already involved with that program, we encourage you to do so. Remember that silicosis is incurable, but it is preventable. Thank you, and again, please look at the resources provided online.